6, and, you know, Paul was instructing the church in Corinth on sexual immorality. And, you know, what I was thinking about while Donna was singing that song was just how God does not, he does not want anyone to perish. God has a standard. He sets standards. But if we don't meet those standards, he's looking to help us to meet those standards, right? He sent his son to die for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins. But not only that, that the Holy Spirit would come and live in us so that we could learn to live righteously, so that we could meet the standard. Amen? So what we're going to find today, and I'm going to need your help with it, it's early in the morning, I understand that, so it is hard to have a lot of energy early in the morning, but I'm going to need, I'm going to need some help because we're going to talk about a sensitive subject still, and I can tell you, if I get a lot of blank faces or a lot of, you know, tired looks, it's going to, it's going to scare me, and uh, <laughs> so I'm going to need your help is all I'm saying here. Uh, we're going to talk about the problem of overcorrection is the first and overarching topic that we're going to talk about. So one of the great things about going straight through a book of the Bible is that you don't have the opportunity as a minister to uh, just skip the inconvenient parts. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you know, there, there are certain books, you know, any, so raise your hand if you've ever been a Sunday school teacher. There are certain books you don't typically cover in Sunday school, right? You don't cover the book Song of Solomon very much. You know, there's some things that you don't talk about very often in Sunday school. It's inconvenient. It's difficult. There are some things we would rather, you know, not discuss, especially if you're teaching children, right? Obviously. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with a lot of problems that were going on in the church. One of the great things is that we have to reconcile these problems. But an even better thing is that we get the context of the scripture. One of the most important things about studying the Word of God is getting the context right. Because you can take a verse out of just about any book of the Bible in any place, and you can warp it to twist whatever you want it to say if you just take that verse. But when you go through and you get the preceding chapters, the following chapters, you get everything around different verses, you get a much, much better understanding of exactly what God is trying to teach you through that verse. This is very important. This is something that if you read the Bible at home, which I hope you read your Bible at home, you start to take more and more notice of and pay attention to the context. What is actually going on? You know, read, if you're reading the chapter, you say, well, that doesn't make much sense. Read the chapter before it. See if that helps it make more sense. Read the chapter after. See if that helps it make more sense. Try to figure out what was going on historically at the time. Those are contextual things that help the scripture come to life. So last week in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul was talking about sexual immorality. But there were some in the church who tried to overcorrect that problem. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We, as, as human beings, are often problem solvers. And that's a good thing. But sometimes we will see a problem come up, and rather than taking the time and having one of the fruits of the Spirit, spirit patience, show through us, we want to jump immediately to the first solution to solve the problem. And sometimes we can mess up in our solution, correct? For every error in doctrine in the church, there is an equal and opposite error on the complete opposite side, it would seem. And that's, that's what Paul is dealing with here. However, this is a sensitive subject, and I'm going to do my best to discuss it in a sensitive way, because, you know, there are young ears, and also there's, there's no need for me to be crude or, you know, overly verbose in anything I'm going to say. So we're going to be very sensitive about it, but turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Starting in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 7, which we're going to split this into two, uh, two weeks here. This week we're talking mostly to the married people, next week mostly to the single people. There's going to be great advice for both groups of people, but this week we're focusing mostly on the first half, which is mostly instruction to married people. In verse 1 it says, Now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have relations with a woman. Because of the sexual immorality that was going on in the church, some thought, well then we should just, you know, that should just not be part of our lives at all, as far as, you know, those relations in a proper context. There are some who said, well, basically just cut the entire, you know, get rid of the whole idea of that and you won't have any problems. Have we seen that happen in our culture at certain, you know, in certain places? Can you think of examples of that? You don't have to say them out loud. Can you think of examples of that? 
Have you heard, you know, I'm sure, you know, even if you don't follow the news that closely, you've likely heard about the scandals that went on in the Catholic Church over the course of the past 10 and 15 years that, that broke out about that. Well, what happened? They, they forbid priests to marry, and those priests still had certain desires, and because they did not have a righteous way to fulfill those desires, they fulfilled those desires in very unrighteous ways, right? Right? So there are consequences to beliefs. There are consequences to these things. So some thought, well, hey, we should just cut that off altogether. And we'll see from the context of the passage, he's not even just talking about unmarried people. He was saying that married people shouldn't have marital relations. He tried to overcorrect because of sexual immorality. The church in Corinth also had people on the complete other side. Okay? Now, Remember, because we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians for a while. Remember, this church was arguing over just about everything. Everything. Oh, well, I follow Paul. Well, I follow Peter. Well, I follow Apollos. They were so distracted by these other issues that they weren't even fulfilling their primary purpose. I have found that if you get the primary part right the secondary parts start to work themselves out. The primary part is, I want to follow Jesus. I want to do what he wants me to do. If that is your focus, everything else becomes possible. If your focus is, well, I want to do this, so I'm going to you know, twist my doctrine so it fits this. No, it has to be Christ and him crucified. That's why Paul started with that. I resolve to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. That is our foundation. If we start with that foundation, everything else can work itself out. If you start with any other foundation, you're going to mess yourselves up. But what does that messing up look like? Well, it looks different for different people. You know, if you were, so I, I'm not getting into politics, but if you were on the liberal side of the political spectrum, you were likely to err in a different way than someone who was on the conservative side of the political spectrum. You can both fall off into error but it'll likely look a little bit different. Make sense? Amen? Okay, so they said, they were writing to Paul, they said, it is good for a man not to have relations with a woman. Paul's response, but because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. He doesn't discount the idea of celibacy, because celibacy is a noble pursuit for those who 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 it has been given to, but... He says that is too much of a restriction to put on the church. Okay? You should not restrict everyone in the church to celibacy. Think about just the long-term implications of if that doctrine would have been applied in the church. Would any Christians have had babies? No. Would there have been any Christian families growing up? No. It wouldn't have been possible. Okay? It, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't fly. So... Because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital responsibility to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. It is good for married couples to have marital relationships. Amen? Amen. I thought I'd get a really loud amen out of that one. But it is good for married couples to have marital relationships. They are designed, it is a gift from God given specifically to married people. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Now, does, he, does having that right, is that just a universal, you know, I can have whatever I want whenever I want it? No. There is still respect within rights, amen? But he's saying, you know, you guys, you guys need each other. Those relations are designed to build a bond within a marriage. And you will find that if, for whatever reason, that activity is neglected in a marriage over the course of time, that bond starts to weaken and frustration can easily enter into a marriage. So he's saying it is, it is good to have those relations. It is good to build that bond within a marriage. It says, do not deprive one another sexually, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer, then come together again, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, once again, I understand that this is a sensitive subject. It is a difficult subject. Amen? But, guess what? We have, you know, 
high rates of teenage pregnancy. We have high rates, you know, of depression. And people are hearing about this subject from the world, but oftentimes in the church, we're scared to talk about it. So they're only getting worldly advice. So as uncomfortable and as, you know, scary of a subject as it is to preach on, it is necessary. We have to understand the proper purpose of this. It is meant for married people to build their marriage. It is good for married people to do married acts to build their marriage. There are times to abstain. The one mentioned here is to devote yourself to prayer. This is similar to fasting food. There are times I need, you know, if, if, if you need to focus, you take some time away from that to focus on prayer and building your relationship with God. That is good. Obviously, there are also other practical times to abstain from these activities. We're, we're not going to go into a lot of depth because I don't need to go into a lot of depth. You can work this out between you and your spouse and the Lord. But understand that it is a good thing. Many in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, you know, even continuing till now, uh, you know, we just don't want to talk about it. We're scared to talk about it. I am terrified to preach on this. So I said, I need your help. It is a scary subject, but do you see the need for us to talk about it? Yeah. Now, there are different contexts to talk about it in different ways, and, and we might have some opportunities to do that. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on stuff because, you know, there are kids present. There, you know, it's a sensitive thing. But I want to start the conversation. I know that there are married people in this church that probably want to have a better marriage. I'd say everyone wants to have a better marriage. Even if you have a good marriage, you always want to have a better marriage. Amen? Okay? So it's a good thing for us to talk about marriage. Amen? Okay, good. So leaving that for now, we'll come back to it, you know, at another date, at another time. He's saying this is good for married people to use. Don't completely shut that off just because people abuse it. Let me talk about an area of overcorrection in my life. Because it, sometimes when you overcorrect a problem, you create more problems. I was a basketball coach a few years back. And many people in my church, we were all indoctrinated in a life of athletics from the time we were very young. And athletics was our life mission. One of my best friends, he was a Division I football player. I've mentioned some of this stuff before, but I'm, I'm mentioning it again. I loved sports. But God started to reveal my sinful nature to me when I was involved in a lot of those sports. He would, he would rebuke me on, hey, why'd you, just, why'd you say that to that referee? Why'd you say that to that official? That person's a human being created in my image. Why are you disrespecting them? Oh, hey, why, why are you trying to humiliate that person out on the court when you're playing? You know, play the game, that's fine, but why are you trying to do that? He was showing me, he was sanctifying me and showing me my sin through that activity. But my immediate response was, well, I just need to get rid of the game of basketball. I need to stop playing that. I need to completely get away from that, right? I think I've talked to some of you about this. So I got completely away from it in some ways. I was a coach, though. When God was revealing this to me and I went to overcorrect it, we were in the middle of the season. Would it have been a righteous thing for me to just quit coaching right there in the middle of the season, leave all my middle school boys, you know, just without a coach and leave the school scrambling to find another one? No. So my overcorrection would have created more problems. But I wanted out of it. I wanted completely away from it. You know what I've learned in my time that I got away completely from the game of basketball? Basketball wasn't the problem. I was the problem. I tried to get rid of that because I thought that would solve it. But no, the problem was my sin nature in me. God wants to fix our sin nature in us. That's what he sent Jesus to do. There came a point in time where I was playing basketball and I was starting to get angry. And once again, God rebuked me again. He said, why are you behaving that way? He said, if you're behaving that way, you better just stop playing. And I didn't have to stop playing. It just, something changed very quickly. I didn't get angry anymore. I was still able to play, but I was able to just have fun. I never knew what it was like to play sports for fun. I always just wanted to win. <laughs> Some of you can relate to me there. But all of a sudden, it, there was just this freedom that came in with it. And there was also this freedom from obligation. I was raised thinking that, you know, oh, I've got to go in and I've got to practice. I've got to do Because if you want to succeed, you have to put time into it, right? 
Is, is Bill in here? He's a coach. Any other coaches in here? If you want to succeed, you've got to put time into your sport, okay? But then when I got out of school, I still felt obligated to put time into it. Why? What was it benefiting me? If I was having fun, play it. If I'm not having fun, why am I wasting time on it? So God wanted to free me from the hold it had on me. Bill, I was just talking about you. Oh, he can hear me. Okay, good. I wanted, he wanted to free me from the hold it had on me, but I wanted to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. I overcorrected my problem. It's the same way with this kind of stuff. Let's move on to the next portion, and it'll still apply here. It says, I say the following as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were just like me. Do you ever wish that? Oh, heaven forbid everybody were just like me. Uh, he says, I wish all people were just like me, but each has his own gift from God, one person in this way and another in that way. There is no record in history that I've found of Paul being married. He had a singular focus on the ministry. Okay, now picture this, if you will. Uh, he traveled from town to town spreading the gospel constantly under physical assault. He was stoned multiple times. He was beaten with lashes. He was shipwrecked. Imagine if he had a wife at home constantly worried about him while he was doing this. Or imagine even still he had a wife traveling with him. And now instead of being focused singularly on the gospel, he, had, he would have to, by obligation, he would need to focus on keeping his wife safe, right? So Paul had a specific call to singleness. And he says, hey, I wish it were that way for everybody. But each has his different gift. Peter, on the other hand, was a married man. Peter was married, or at least betrothed, when Jesus called him. How do we know that? Well, because, what's up? His mother-in-law got sick. His mother-in-law got sick. We see that Jesus came and healed Peter's mother-in-law. So therefore, Peter had to have been married. Okay? Peter still had a role in the gospel. He still had a role in the ministry. And he still had a sad, uh, tragic end in that, which glorified God, a painful end. But he had a different gift and a different calling than Paul. Likewise, Paul, when he's talking to Timothy about instructions for those who are in leadership in the church, he says that a, an overseer should be the husband of one wife, right? I can tell you, and I've told you before, I was not ready to be a pastor before Kelsey, it is amazing how much my perspective began to change on certain things once I had a wife. Before Kelsey, I, I consider myself a very, uh, well, I still consider myself this way, but I consider myself to be a very rational thinker. I, I'm good at just sort of calculating things based on logic, but I wasn't always very good at empathy, at understanding where people are at when they're suffering or you know, feeling what people feel. Having a wife, having Kelsey as my wife, has helped me grow so much in that area to be able to listen to people, to try to understand, which is a very important role of a pastor who's going to be sticking around, right? It's a very important skill set to have. So each has a different gift from God, one person in this way and one in another way. So it is good for some people to be married and for others to be unmarried, huh? Okay? I say to the unmarried and the widows... It is good for them if they remain as I am. But if they don't have self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with desire. There was a long time I thought that I was called to a life of singleness, that I was going to live my entire life as a single man, focused, you know, solely on the kingdom of God. I had become content with that. But what I found over the course of time was it, it was quite lonely at times. I didn't have anyone to share the highs and lows of life with. And thanks be to God, over the course of time, he blessed me with a wife. Says, hey, it's okay to marry. It's not wrong to marry. It's good to marry. Everyone has a different calling. Let's continue on because I'm already pretty much out of time. Uh, he says, I command the married, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must be remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to leave his wife. My favorite part of this verse, that's so weird to say, I like how Paul points out. He says, I command the married, not I, but the Lord. So there is a command from the Lord not to leave your spouse. Not to overcorrect a problem, so to speak. We all have problems that come up in our marriage. It's very natural. 
But God commands us to work it out. But there's a concession in verse 11. If she does leave, so what, what's that saying? Naturally, there's going to be times people get divorced, right? There are people in this church who have been divorced. What does it say to do? The command is to remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Now, what happens if people disobey that command? Have people disobey that command? Sure. Are there consequences to it? Yes. Does God cast you out? No. God reconciles. God heals. When Jesus went to the woman at the well, she had been married how many times? Anybody remember? Five. When he went to save her, did he say, okay, now go back to your very first husband? No, if you've been divorced and remarried, does God want you to then, if you get saved after that, does he want you to divorce your current wife and go back to your first wife? No. That's not what he's saying here, but he's saying as a command, hey, don't get divorced. Stay together. Divorce is far too common in the world and it's far too common in the church. Amen? Okay. God does not want divorce. There's no such thing as a consequence-free divorce. Anyone who's went through it knows it's a painful and difficult process. Okay? So that's why God commands us, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. But it doesn't mean there's not hope for people who have done that. Okay? It says, but I, not the Lord, say to the rest. He specifies. This is, just, this is not a command, but this is advice from Paul. It says, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not leave her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not leave her husband. Okay? Even if, so, so this happens a lot, actually. When you come to the Lord, sometimes the husband will get saved and the wife still just not, doesn't go for it. Or the other way, the wife will get saved and the husband just doesn't go for it. I've heard people justify and say, well, hey, I'm a new person now, so I can just leave them. No. It is good to stay with them. If they are willing to stay with you, stay with them. Why? Why is that? Why does God want you to stay with your spouse, even if they're an unbeliever? I know we're not supposed to be unequally yoked, right? But look what it says. It says, for the unbelieving husband is set apart for God by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is set apart for God by the husband. Pause there. You are the best witness to your spouse. Not just with your words, but with your life. The gospel does a miraculous thing in your life that it literally changes your character. Things that I used to be very sinful in, all of a sudden I do them in a righteous way. And if you're married to someone and they start doing things in a righteous way and they've had these flaws your entire marriage, they're going to notice that something has changed over the course of time. Hopefully, right? They're going to see that, that, hey, he used, to, you know, he used to talk this way to me, and now he doesn't. He used to do this, and now he doesn't. Or likewise, she used to do this. They're going to see if there is a change. So the fruit of the Spirit that shows up the most in this entire chapter, in my mind, is the fruit of patience. Do not overcorrect your problems. Do not jump to conclusions too quickly. Give it time. Otherwise, the other consequence, your children will be corrupt, but now they are set apart for God. Everyone who has children who's went through divorce knows that it's a painful thing for a child, right? Even if the marriage was in a terrible way, it is a painful thing for the child. Anyone whose parents have went through that, you know it is a painful thing when your parents go through that. But thanks be to God, because I know this is the case for people who are here right now. Thanks be to God, he heals our hurts, amen? Amen. He does not just cast you out if you miss the mark. He doesn't overreact. He wants to teach you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be reconciled. He wants you to be healed. That is his goal. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. For you, wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Or you, husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? If they're going to leave you, ultimately, it is not your fault. Try to make it work, but if they're leaving, it's not on you. Don't beat yourself up over it. Yes, it's st the kids are still going to be hurt by it, but once again, God heals the hurts. Yes, you're still going to be hurt by it, but God still heals the hurts. Amen? If they are going to leave you, sometimes there is nothing you can do about that. I, uh, my youth leader growing up, he and his wife, they were saved, and they were drug addicts before they were saved, and she 
tried to stick with it for a while, but she ultimately wanted to go back to that, that life, and she left her husband. And it broke his heart. It absolutely broke him down. But he had to keep following the Lord, and he, he couldn't convince her to stay with him. It's not his fault. He's not condemned for that. You're not condemned on that. It's okay. Live at peace. However, each one must live his life in the situation the Lord assigned when God called him. This is what I command in all the churches. I have a few more slides, but we're going to cut off here now because I'm already a little bit over time and I want you guys to make it Sunday school. But this verse is where we're going to pick up next week. Live your life in the situation that the Lord assigned you when God called you. Don't think, okay, I got saved. Now I have to completely change everything about everything that I do. No, here's the thing. God wants to teach you. God wants to show you, and he will often do a work in how he brings you out of something. There have been habits that I've tried to break myself very quickly, and they've stuck around. But then when God breaks that habit, he does so in a way that glorifies him and gives you an opportunity to testify to it. So he says, don't, don't be so quick to jump to do this or that. Stay in the situation that you're in when God calls you, and then he will show you what to do. He will teach you. The Lord is our teacher. The, in closing, promise, not a lie. God wants you to be saved. I can't tell you why, but this is one of the hardest things for us to grasp at times, especially church people. I grew up with the idea that uh, God's just waiting for me to mess up and then he's going to kick me to the curb. And it's been so hard for me to work that out of my mind. But God wants you to be saved. He wants you to figure it out. He is not looking to keep you out of the kingdom. He wants you to get there and he's going to show you the way if you will simply go to him. That's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Go to the cross and say, teach me, show me, let me understand this. Apply this to my life. And he will. But it takes time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for their attentive ears. And dear God, I ask that you bless us with good marriages. That Lord, the advice that we're given here, that Lord, we, we don't even come to that point in our marriages. That we never even get to the point where we think of divorce. Oh God, let us work these things out. Lord, let us trust you and follow you to show us what to do. Guide us, O oh God, for your glory and for the glory of your Son. Bless us today as we go through Sunday school and throughout the rest of our day. I ask in the perfect name of Jesus. Amen.